Electric cars. Depending on who you ask, they're either the future or the devil. A vital tool in our mission to net carbon neutrality or a can of worms that creates as many problems as they solve. I've often joked that nothing makes otherwise disinterested people become environmentalists quicker than talking about solar panels or electric cars. Your EV is just a coal-powered car. That's a fun one. Or think about all the ecological devastation mining for battery materials causes. Hmm, weird. I always thought fossil fuels had to be drilled and fracked, then refined using gobs of electricity, then transported sometimes thousands of miles only to be burnt for an instant of value. But that's not what we're talking about today. No, today we're talking about one of my favorites, the question of whether our aging grid here in the US could even cope with a world full of electric vehicles. Is mass EV adoption even possible here in the United States with our existing infrastructure or will the increased demand for electricity caused by a growing popularity of electric cars cripple our grid and leave us all living an Amish lifestyle? Spoiler alert, no. I'm Ricky and this is Fully Charged. Looking for some sunshine and clean air? Well, where better than Southern California this September? We're bringing all of the electric vehicles under the sun and an array of clean technologies to America's finest city this fall. Yes, that's right. Fully Charged Live USA, powered by Electrify America, is coming to San Diego. So for fresh perspectives, exhilarating test rides, electrifying live talks, and all of your favorite YouTubers, Get your tickets today. Now, it's no secret the US grid does struggle from time to time. I mean, we get brownout warnings when it's a bit warm outside and the utilities know people will be running their air conditioners. So there's no way we can charge all these EVs, right? Right? To answer that, let's look at the numerous challenges of operating an electrical grid, a rather unenviable task. If we compare electricity to other utilities piped into your home, you'll quickly start to see the challenge. And while we're even talking about this, water and natural gas are plumbed into your homes and pressurized. In the case of water, usually around 50 to 80 PSI. If you don't need water right now, no problem. The pumps and water towers keep that pressure built up, ready for when you need it. You can source water whenever you want, store it, and just let consumers use it as needed. But this isn't the case with electricity. You can't just pipe in electricity and wait for when it might be needed. That's because electricity needs to be created and consumed pretty much instantaneously. Create too much and you need to curtail it or basically waste it. Create too little and you can get voltage sags, possibly damage sensitive equipment and eventually get brownouts or strategic power cuts made to certain regions to protect the larger grid. If we look at electricity consumption in the United States since the 1950s, you'll see a pretty dramatic trend. Our thirst for electricity is massive and climbing. From retail sales of electricity of about 0.3 trillion kilowatt hours in 1950s to nearly 4 trillion kilowatt hours or 3,900 terawatt hours by 2020. But here's the crazy part. The percentage of the electricity used for transportation currently is a negligibly tiny sliver. And this is at the heart of the argument that if we start adding tons of electricity usage due to electric cars to an aging and already taxed grid, surely it can't cope. According to the Federal Highway Administration, Americans drive roughly 3.2 trillion miles a year. To convert every single one of those miles to electric and assuming an average EV efficiency of three miles per kilowatt hour, like a Tesla Model X, that means we'd need about one trillion kilowatt hours of electricity. So yearly consumption would go from four trillion kilowatt hours to five, a 25% increase. Put one way, we could make all cars EVs tomorrow for just 25% more electricity. But put another way, we'd need one trillion kilowatt hours of electricity. But it might not even be that bad. Jack recently did an episode on Aptera, a truly new rethink of what a vehicle can be. We'll put a link in the description, but an Aptera can travel about 10 miles per kilowatt hour. And if we all drove around in EVs that efficient, the increased demand on the grid would be cut by two thirds. Because of course, the more efficient the electric car, the less additional electricity we need. 
Plus, with solar panels, it's possible you'd never need to charge an Aptera at all. I really want to see efficiency getting more attention in modern electric car design, not just because it can reduce our electricity demand, but because efficient EVs are just better and cheaper to run. Another consideration that hardly ever gets brought up during these conversations is about grid demand and how much electricity oil refineries consume each year. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, in 2021, oil refineries alone used nearly 43 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, not to mention nearly 1 trillion cubic feet or 28.3 billion cubic meters of natural gas and all sorts of other fuels. But who's counting? Some estimates even place the true electricity consumption of the whole life cycle of gasoline, not just refineries, at closer to 100 billion kilowatt hours per year. That's nearly one tenth of all the electricity we would need for 100% EVs. So getting rid of those would be a great start, but we'll still need to find a bit more energy. So let's take a look at the US power usage over a 24 hour period. You have probably heard this referred to as the duck curve. See, so it kind of looks like a cute little duck. But in the age of solar power, we have a bit of a problem. When the sun shines, you see what happens to energy demand. It falls dramatically during the day, then peaks at night when the sun goes down. This is a huge problem for grid operators because they run baseline power plants to cover the average usage. These could be natural gas, nuclear, or even coal. The baseline is designed to be as close to the minimum energy demand as possible. Then during times of the day when the energy demand rises above that baseline, grid operators turn on peaker power plants to provide the difference. The problem is peaker plants are smaller, more expensive, and normally dirtier forms of energy, such as natural gas, for their ability to be turned on and off quickly in response to grid need. This is why many regions have moved to time of use billing, where consumers are charged more money in the evening when everyone is getting home and starting to use more electricity. The beauty of EVs is that you can charge them overnight when the demand for electricity is at its lowest. In fact, here in San Diego, we have a special EV price plan that drops energy prices to just 13 cents per kilowatt hour from midnight to 6 a.m. The problem then isn't raw electricity demand, it's unpredictability and huge spikes. Like in a bygone era before Netflix or on-demand streaming, when Brits famously rushed to their kitchens to turn on their electric kettles for a spot of evening tea after their favorite television programs at nearly the same time. A major challenge for grid operators. It's a massive change in demand for a small period of time, and it's something grid operators have to forecast and handle in real time. So if EVs are all smart and can be programmed to charge at strategic times, it's very possible the end result to the grid is a flat, rising baseline. And this might not be as bad as you think. When internal combustion engines first came on the scene 100 years ago, people had the same concerns that they'd never work because people would never have wide access to gasoline. Just stick with your horse. Trust me, this motor car fad too will pass. But in a free market, challenges and issues aren't problems, they're opportunities. Fun fact, early gas stations were local pharmacies and drugstores. If there is a general increase in electrical demand, it will be financially advantageous to open new power plants. Better yet, if we ramp up renewable energy production like wind and solar, we could use these very same EVs as battery storage to even further levelize the grid. Remember, your utility is a middleman. They don't produce electricity, they buy it from power plants and sell it to you. They don't much care where they buy this electricity from. And with new innovative ideas like Tesla's auto bidder that allows Powerwall owners to buy and sell electricity almost like a stock market, if you have a solar system and an EV, you can make money even when your car is parked. This is called a virtual power plant. And in the future with a more decentralized grid, the energy used in your home might be coming from Gary down the road and not from a power plant. The average gas car is totally useless sitting around on your driveway, but an EV is essentially a mobile power plant on wheels. And with companies embracing vehicle to grid technology like Ford with its F-150 Lightning, you could buy electricity during times of lower demand when it's cheap and sell it back to the grid when it's expensive. In fact, we saw an amazing example of how helpful EVs can be by serving as big battery packs during the recent floods in Kentucky. According to a report by Electric, just two F-150 Lightnings alone help provide mobile power for workers to assist with getting 10 to 15 families back in their homes each and every day. 
And even if you don't have a driveway or home charging, you could benefit from cleaner forms of energy as you charge at public chargers, since that energy could in the future come from people with solar panels or EVs using these virtual power plant programs. Talk about a win-win. Future virtual power plant programs, try saying that three times fast, could allow users to specify how much energy they're willing to trade. Even with just 10 kilowatt hours out of a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack, 100 million EVs could provide 1 billion kilowatt hours of energy storage every day. That's the equivalent of 7,752 of Tesla's mega pack installations, like the Hornsdale Power Reserve in South Australia. A level of grid storage we've never seen before, and that's just 10 kilowatt hours, still leaving drivers with plenty of charge for their daily needs. Technologies like vehicle to grid for smart electric school buses also offer huge potential that could reduce how much more we need from the grid. We can take an asset that transports kids for two hours a day and then just sits there for the other 22 and instead make them massive energy storage solutions. And how about this? A Tesla supercharger station covered in solar panels in Kettleman City, California, featuring about 750 panels. If each panel was 350 watts, that's a little over 263 kilowatts of power. That's enough to charge three EVs at 87 kilowatts with zero grid strength. In short, is our grid here in the US a bit long in the tooth? Yes, it is. But the future is electric. It's why utilities love EVs. They know it'll mean profits will shift from oil companies to electricity companies. And any good business will invest in their infrastructure if it means reaching larger profits. Also, it's important to note just how much in subsidies oil companies received over the last century to get to where they are today. And future infrastructure and spending, I believe, will move away from oil and gas and towards a truly electric future. For every person that says the grid can't cope, there was a horse breeder that said gas cars wouldn't work. It's the nature of change. Imagine trying to pitch an idea for a social media app to investors 30 years ago. Things change, and we're gonna have to stop looking at the future through the lens of the past. Let's continue this conversation in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you so much for watching.